Um, I don't know if you could speak upon the mild cognitive impairment. Sure. So level. yeah. So mild cognitive impairment um, is um, a, a person may have mild cognitive impairment, but it may not lead to Alzheimer's disease. It's significant enough that the person is experiencing some changes in their cognition, mm -hmm. um, like they are forgetful, but it really doesn't. Um, disrupt their daily life um, and there's a, a lot going on in research um, to try at last Timmy mentioned um, try to um, identify those triggers that may lead to Alzheimer's later on currently what we're finding is that sometimes people are living with the disease um, you know several years before they even get a diagnosis um, yeah. so we really w like to talk to people about being proactive and the importance of early detection when you first notice some of those symptoms now you you had mentioned that you know you you for purposes of the research you're almost kind of consciously looking for people yeah. are you we, literally looking you with the so, Alzheimer's Association so we have or? We, we have a program called Trial Match, which mm -hmm. um, there is a link to our website um, that people can go on our website, click on Trial Match, and then answer some a series of questions. Mm -hmm. And then what we try to do is we try to connect them with a local research trial that's going on in their I local see. community. Going on to trial match doesn't, uh, you're not committing um, to a, a clinical trial, but um, you know, we will often say, you know, it takes money um, for research, but we also need the bodies. We need people both right. healthy and also in the early stages, I caregivers um, to participate in clinical trials so that we can really create a world without Alzheimer's disease. So this is really something that in, in which a lot of people can really help. Absolutely. Not only themselves, but a whole lot of other folks by helping us to try to figure this out. Absolutely. Then, once again, until I think I got really involved in this thing, it was some of you folks that really kind of acquainted me with this notion of doing the research, of getting the research done ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Because there are some physical thing or genes things that can be seen in genes kind of early on, right, that may be predictive of some of this. Yeah, stuff. so, um, you know, certainly there is a uh, genetic link, um, but currently less than 5% of all diagnoses are mm -hmm. related to heredity. Uh, heredity. Um, so yes, you That's are. That's an amazing statistic. Yeah, so, Less than five mm -hmm, percent. Yeah. So I mean, you you if you have a parent yeah. uh, or several blood relatives that have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease have died of Alzheimer's. Yes, you you are a greater risk. Yeah. Um, but it is um, age is the biggest known risk factor at this point. We are living a lot longer than we did forty years ago. Yes. Yes. Kind of like a kind of like a mixed blessing. Mm -hmm, it is. Right. So. Um, once again, when you're seeing folks in those early stages and they've got, and it looks like they may be having some issues, mm -hmm. at what point, at what point when you're talking to them, do you say, you know, you really need to talk to your doctor mm -hmm. about this, right? Immediately. Immediately. Yes. And, and any concern. Because the, the scary thing, well, it's actually a relieving thing that, that there's so many things health-wise that could mm -hmm. be going mm -hmm. on that could look like someone's developing a dementia when really they're not. So talking about these concerns with the doctor, so many people are um, afraid of doing that mm -hmm. because they're afraid of what might come out of it. But it's very important to go and uh, bring these concerns up because it might be something easily treated like depression. Or now it's funny, that you, it's funny though that, that you mentioned that, like go to the doctor right away. Are, are doctors annual physicals? Do you, know, do you know if doctors, as part of those annual f physicals, do any kind of testing that would detect this kind of early stage? Um, certainly there are some doctors that are very proactive, um, but I think in general, 
uh, like a screening yeah. isn't done. Yeah. Um, that's why I think with this um, disease, with Alzheimer's disease, you really have to be proactive and you really have to advocate for either yourself or your family member if you're concerned about them yep. so that um, the doctor does take your concerns seriously. And, and have that test on. I wonder if that's a Medicare covered matter when they're going in for their annual um, checkup because the annual checkup is covered. Is a Medicare covered? That's it. It's just something that occurred to me as we were talking. It's like that's something that we should really look at. Well, if they that's go to a diagnostic clinic right. yes. at the order of a physician. Or at the right. order of a right. physician. Right. Yeah. That's a really interesting question. Yeah. That's a really interesting question. So. Um, we've been talking about the things that you can do to kind of keep Alzheimer's from occurring. We were talking about kind of how you spot it early on. We're going to take a short break, and then in the second part of the show, we're going to be talking about what do you do. You know, if you really think that this is, a, this is a real issue, that somebody, you or someone you love has Alzheimer's in the early stages, what are the possibilities, and how can you, how can you keep it from progressing? Uh, we'll see you in a couple minutes. Thank you. dealing with the daily struggles of caring for a loved one, we hear you. That's why AARP created a community with experts and other caregivers to help us better care for ourselves and the ones we love. Uh, welcome back to Bergeron Briefs. Uh, with me are my two wonderful guests, Julie McMurray from the Alzheimer's Association of uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire, uh, and Tammy Pazaricki, uh, who runs Pleasantries, uh, an adult uh, day home uh, in uh, Marlboro, Mass. So we've been talking, we were talking in the first part of the show about the way that you might be able to prevent or reduce your risk of getting Alzheimer's and also kind of a what, about what those early symptoms might be that you might are, be concerned that might actually show that you have Alzheimer's or show you have something else and how to deal with that. But I guess the next question and the point of this part of the show is so now what? So someone's found out or really do, does believe that either they or their spouse, or their parent, or, or aunt or uncle, right, really has what looks like the early stages of Alzheimer's. So now what do you do? Who do you talk to? What do you do? So hopefully um, the family uh, will contact the Alzheimer's Association. At the beginning of the show, Arthur, you mentioned our 24-hour, seven-day-a-week helpline. And, and by the way, we're going we're gonna to have that as a banner at the end of the show. We'll, we'll uh, get that information okay. available to you. So you're going to see that, so you can write all that information down after you, as you, watch, after you watch this show. Right. And um, through the helpline, um, an individual, family member, caregiver can speak to one of our um, clinicians mm -hmm. uh, talk to talk about they have this diagnos diagnosis now, what happens, and we can really help them navigate uh, community resources. We can provide them with um, information on really taking control of um, this disease um, and what they need to do as far as... So is this a really local hotline? I mean, so, they, they yeah, so it, um, our... our uh, our helpline, yeah, exactly. You, our yeah. helpline. We have our clinicians out of our Watertown office. Yeah. Um, but if they call the one eight hundred number, which is eight hundred two seven two three nine zero zero during the day, mm -hmm. um, biz regular business hours, they speak to a clinician um, in our Watertown office. After hours, um, we have a contact center that is based out of our national office in Chicago, mm -hmm. and they are, are people there to man um, the helpline throughout the evening hours and during the night. Um, and then we find out locally the next day if someone from Grafton, Millbury, Uxbridge has called that helpline. I see. So that's the advantage of having an organization that's got this many these many roots in the community. Absolutely, absolutely. And so you're going to be pointing them to. Probably the first person they're going to talk to is going to be their primary care physician. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what we right. can do is we provide them with um, what to talk about um, to their primary care um, physician. We also let them know about what to expect during a diagnostic workup. 
um, in how to advocate for themselves. Yeah. Um, but we also will refer them to an, a, a local attorney like yourself um, to make sure they have, this isn't an app. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, financial um, and you know legal documents, you know, all in place um, to start, you know, planning for the future. Right. But also um, educate them on other community programs that are out there, like. Um, Tammy's um, and the benefits of adult day health services. And we're, and, and we're going to talk about this in a second. By the way, th this isn't an ad for legal services, but if you are an older person, the two things that you have to have, I'm just going to mention them, mm -hmm. you have to have the only two essential legal documents, you have to have a power of attorney, you have to have a health care mm -hmm. proxy. So if you get into an accident yeah. and, and you're incapacitated, for, if for whatever reason you're incapacitated, someone can make your legal decisions for you and someone that you trust can make your health care decisions for you. I just wanted to mention that. It's very, very important. They're very inexpensive. You talk to your lawyer. You need to get that done. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to mention um, the association also has the care consultation. Yeah. I, I, thought, I think that's important right. to mention. So as, a, um, as also another benefit, um, mm -hmm. We can offer a care consultation um, to families, which is uh, free of charge, as all as are all of our services at the Alzheimer's Association. And a care consultation is an opportunity to sit down with a clinician, mm -hmm. um, and really it allows the family to tell their story, what their concerns are, what their questions are, and the clinician will. Um, talk to them and really help to educate them on um, ways to address those needs um, that they may have. Also, we may go over ways to communicate, yep. um, how to decrease behaviors. Um, we provide information on uh, local community resources, whether it's an adult day health center, whether it's a, an assisted living that offers memory and care. Um, but the, it is a sit-down meeting, um, and again, it's free of charge. And I, I find that the families that I work with um, feel that it is um, a very uh, beneficial that's, uh, program. That's terrific. And I think one of, one of the, or a set of people I think that really helps I think there are so many people who are even embarrassed to talk to their doctor mm -hmm, about mm -hmm, this, mm -hmm. or they don't want it on their they don't want it on their chart. Right. They'd rather talk to somebody else, and, mm -hmm. and they can have that kind of conversation, not just about about the disease and about the symptoms, but to begin to start figure out how the family adjusts to mm -hmm. all of this stuff in terms of who's going to play what role, how does this, how does all this work. 